Hey guys, um, here we are. Say hi. Hi, Margo says hi. Nope, look at her. She won't even talk. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Mm -mm. She doesn't listen to me. She listens to me like you guys do. Now, now she probably wants to go to the nurse like you guys always want to. Sheesh. Anyway, are you guys ready for some City of Ember? How about chapter 10? Ooh, this one's a big one. Blue sky and goodbye. Page 132. Lena slept restlessly that night. She had frightening dreams in which something dangerous was lurking in the darkness. When the lights went on in the morning and she opened her eyes, her first thought was of the door and the pipeworks. And then right away, she felt a thud of disappointment because the door was locked and someone else, not her, knew what was behind it. She went in to wake Granny. Time to get up, she said, but Granny didn't answer. She was lying with her mouth half open and breathing in a strange, coarse way. Ugh, don't feel so good, Ugh, she finally said in a weak voice. Lena felt Granny's forehead. It was hot. Her hands were very cold. She ran for Mrs. Murdo and after that to Cloving Square to tell Captain Fleary she would not be coming to work today. Then she ran to Oliver Street, to the office of Dr. Tower, where she banged on the door until the doctor opened it. Dr. Tower was a thin woman. Ugh. Dr. Tower was a thin woman with uncombed hair and shadows under her eyes. When she saw Lena, she seemed to grow even more tired. Dr. Tower, Lena said, my grandmother is sick, will you come? I will, she said, but I can't promise to help her. I'm low on medicine. But come and look, maybe she doesn't need medicine. Lena led the doctor the few blocks to her house. When she saw Granny, the doctor sighed. Mm, how are you, Granny Mayfleet? She asked. Granny looked at the daughter, uh, at the doctor, blearily. I think ill, she said. The doctor laid a hand across her forehead. She asked her to stick out her tongue, and she listened to her heart and her breathing. She has a fever, the doctor told Lena. You'll need to stay home with her today. Make some soup, give her some water to drink, put some rags in cool water, then lay, it, and then lay them across her forehead. She picked up Granny's bony hand in her rough reddish one. What's best for you is sleep today, she said. Your good granddaughter will take care of you. And all day, that's what Lena did. She made a thin soup of spinach and onions and fed it to Granny a spoonful at a time. She stroked Granny's forehead, held her hand, and talked to her about cheerful things. She kept Poppy as quiet as she could, but as she did all this, in the back of her mind was the memory of the days of her father's illness, when he seemed to go, grow dim like a lamp losing power and the sound of his breathing was like water gurgling through a clogged pipe. Though she didn't want to, she remembered the evening when her father let out one last short breath and didn't take another. And the morning, a few months later, when Dr. Tower emerged from her mother's bedroom with a crying baby and a face that was heavy with bad news. In the late afternoon, Granny got restless. She lifted herself up on one elbow. Did we find it? She asked Lena. Did we ever find it? Find what, Granny? The thing that was lost, Granny said. The old thing that my grandfather lost. Yes, said Lena. Don't worry, Granny. We found it. It's safe now. Oh, oh, good, Granny said. 
Granny sank back onto her pillows and smiled at the ceiling. What a relief, she said. She coughed a couple of times, closed her eyes, and fell asleep. Lena stayed home from work the next day as well. It was a long day. Granny dozed most of the time. Poppy, delighted to have Lena at home to play with, kept toddling over with things found. Dust rags, kitchen spoons, stray shoes, and whacking them against Lena's knees saying, play with this, play with this. Lena was glad to play with her, but after a while, she'd had enough of spoon banging and rag tugging and shoe rolling. Let's do something else, she said to Poppy. Shall we draw? Granny had drunk a full cup of soup for dinner and was falling asleep again, so Lena got out her colored pencils and two of the can labels she had been saying. They were white on the back and made a good enough drawing paper if you flattened them out. With their sharpest kitchen knife, she whittled the pencils into points, and she herself took the blue pencil and smoothed out the other can label on the side. Oh, I beg your pardon. With her sharpest kitchen knife, she whittled out pencils to, into points. She gave, the green, she gave the green pencil and one can label to Poppy, forgive me, and she herself took the blue pencil and smoothed out the other can label on the table. What would she draw? Taking hold of the pencil was like opening a tap inside of her mind through which her imagination flowed. She could feel the pictures ready to come out. It was a sort of pressure, like a water in a pipe. She always thought that she could draw something wonderful, but what she actually drew never quite matched the feeling. It was like when she tried to tell a dream, the words never really captured how it felt. Poppy was grasping the pencil in her fist and making a wild scribble. Look it, she cried. <laughs> Lovely, said Lena. Then, without even a clear idea of what was meant to be, she began to draw her own picture. She started on the left side of the can label. First, she drew a tall, narrow box, a building. Then more boxes next to it, a cluster of buildings. Next, she drew a few tiny people walking on the street below the building. It was what she nearly always drew, the other city. And every time she drew it, she had the same frustrating feeling that there were more to be drawn, that there were other things in this city. There were marvels there, but she couldn't imagine what they were. All she knew was that this city was bright and in a different way from Ember. There, where the brightness came from, she didn't know. She drew more buildings and filled in the windows and doors. She put in street lamps. She added a greenhouse. All the way across the paper, she drew buildings of different sizes. All the buildings were white because that was the color of the paper. She set her pencil down for a moment and studied what she'd done. It was time to fill in the sky. In the picture she'd done with regular pencils, the, the sky was its true color, black. But this time she made it blue because she was using her blue pencil. Methodically, as Poppy scratched and scribbled beside her, Lena colored in the space above the buildings her pencil moving back and forth in short lines until the entire sky was blue. She sat back and looked at her picture. <laughs> Wouldn't it be strange, she thought, to have a blue sky? But she liked the way it looked. It would be beautiful, a blue sky. Poppy had started using her pencil to poke holes in the paper Lena folded up her own picture and took Poppy's away from her. Time for dinner, she said. Sometime, deep in the night, Lena woke suddenly, thinking she'd heard something. Had she been dreaming? She lay still, her eyes open in the darkness. The sound came again, a, a weak, trembling call. Lena. 
She got up and started for Granny's room. Though she had lived in the same house all her life, she still had trouble finding her way at night when the darkness was complete. It was as if walls had shifted slightly and furniture moved to new places. Lena stayed close to the walls, feeling her way along. Here was her bedroom door. Here was the kitchen and the table. Oh, she winced as she stubbed her toe on one of its legs. A little farther and she'd come to the far wall and to the door next to Granny's room. Granny's voice was like a thin line in the dark air. Lena, come help. I need... I'm coming, Granny, she called. She stumbled over something, a shoe maybe, and fell against the bed. Here I am, Granny, she said. She felt for Granny's hand. It was very cold. I feel so strange, said Granny. Her voice was a whisper. I dreamed, I dreamed about my baby, or somebody's baby. Lena sat down on the bed. Carefully, she moved her hands over the narrow ridge of her grandmother's body until she came to her shoulders. There, her fingers tangled in the long wisps of gra Granny's hair. She pressed a finger aside the, uh, as, against the side of Granny's throat to feel for her pulse, as the doctor had shown her. It was fluttery, like a moth that had hurt itself and is flapping in crooked circles. Can I get you some water, Granny? Lena asked. She couldn't think of what else to do. No water, Granny said. Just stay for a while. Lena tucked one foot under her, underneath her and pulled part of the blanket over her lap. She took hold of Granny's hand again and stroked it gently with one finger. For a long time, neither of them said anything. Lena sat listening to her grandmother's breathing. She would take a deep, shuddering breath and let it out in a sigh. Then there would be a long silence before the next breath began. Lena closed her eyes. No use keeping them open. There was nothing to see but the dark. She was aware only of her grandmother's cold, thin hand and the sound of her breathing. Every now and then, Granny would mumble a few words that Lena couldn't make out. And then Lena would stroke her forehead and say, Don't worry, it's all right. It's almost morning. Though she didn't know if it was or was not. After a long time, Granny stirred slightly and seemed to come awake. You go to bed, dear, she said. I'm all right now. Her voice was clear but very faint. You go back to sleep. Lena bent forward until her head rested against Granny's shoulder. Granny's soft hair tickled her face. She whispered, good night, Granny. She squeezed her grandmother's shoulders gently, and as she stood up, a wave of terrible loneliness swept over her. She wanted to see Granny's face. But the darkness hid everything. It might still be a long time until morning. She didn't know. She groped her way back down to her own bed and fell into a deep sleep. And when, hours later, the clock tower struck six and the lights came on, Lena went fearfully into her grandmother's room. She found her very pale and very still, all the life gone out of her. We'll stop here and take a moment of silence for Granny. Goodbye, sweet Granny, and goodbye you. We'll see you in chapter 11.